Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to present. <coughs> um, so I'm going to talk about um, the sort of periprocedural uh, drug therapy. And <coughs> I want to return to um, Protect AF, because at the moment, that's the only study that's been conducting uh, any form of uh, drug therapy assessment under randomized trial conditions. So if we just remind ourselves what Protect AF did, uh, first of all, all the patients that were recruited into the study were already on warfarin, right? So these weren't patients that were contraindicated to warfarin or warfarin naive. A lot of them had been on warfarin for over a year. Um, and once they'd had the device placed, uh, at 45 days they had a TOE. And if at TOE the uh, device position looked satisfactory with no um, peri-device flow, then the warfarin was stopped and uh, the patient was carried on on aspirin and clopidogrel for six months, and finally at six months they went on to aspirin alone. And it's important just to remind ourselves here that these were all patients that could take warfarin without any problems at all. Now in practice, um, at the time this trial was designed, there were no uh, other alternatives to warfarin, but now, of course, we've got three drugs which have been shown in very large, uh, important studies to be effective uh, alternatives to warfarin. And unlike uh, protect AF, which was a non-inferiority study, these studies actually showed uh, either superiority or equivalence to warfarin. So a lot of the patients that just don't like taking warfarin or it's a lifestyle problem for them, for these patients, um, these drugs are really going to be the, the, the most important alternative. However, there is, we should remember, a significant discontinuation rate with these drugs, uh, with up to 25% uh, of patients sometimes not being able to take these drugs for... Um, uh, side effects. So as a result of all of this, the, the reality of our day-to-day -day practice is that we're not seeing the patients that were recruited into Protect AF. The kind of patients we're seeing are those that have an anticoagulation risk, um, obviously with a CHAD score greater than one. And in this patient group, unfortunately, we have no randomized control studies, there are no formal guidelines, and there are certainly no formal guidelines for how to manage the periprocedural drug therapy. So at present, the Protect AF regime is still the only one that remains, um, in a t um, that remains available to us under a tested uh, regime. So if we look at our own practice and the kind of patients we've been putting um, the devices in, um, there have been intracranial bleeds, GI bleeds, uh, epistaxis are the, the biggest group of patients, and then um, a group, a smaller group, where there's been other uh, bleeds, uh, subcutaneous bleeds and intramuscular bleeds, and those patients, particularly with um, problems with other medications, such as arthritis medication, and occasional occupational hazard patients, such as those, uh, particularly farmers and other people that work with heavy machinery uh, who don't like to be on warfarin. So in this group of patients, is it safe for us to use a warfarin followed by aspirin, clopidogrel followed by aspirin uh, protocol? We took the view that um, as this is the only one that's been tested, this is what we should use as our default. And uh, what we did was, if the patients had no recent bleeding, uh, we followed this protocol. And with the small experience we've got of this group, uh, we've not had any problems. And this group of patients where there was either some ongoing bleeding or we were more concerned about their risks, uh, we've used two to four weeks of low molecular weight heparin. But there's no large scale data to compare our own sort of local results to. So <coughs> why do we take this approach and what is the justification for using uh, warfarin in, this, um, in the first uh, few weeks after the procedure? Well, first of all, we know that uh, thrombus can form on the device if you use aspirin and clopidogrel alone. So in this case, we see the, the device implanted in the appendage and thrombus lying over it. And in virtually all of the case reports that I could find, uh, in all cases, patients were put on warfarin and they seemed to clear on anticoagulation. So that tells us that on aspirin clopidogrel alone, you can form thrombus, and with the addition of anticoagulation, you can clear this thrombus, which implies that maybe that one may be better than the other. If we try and drill into some of the uh, Protect AF data and see what we can um, derive from it, um, once the patients had the device implanted and were on the sort of steady state part of the protocol, there were nine post-procedure strokes, which obviously could have been either from a non-left atrial appendage thrombus, um, a device-related thrombus, or suboptimal device placement. 
from the INR data that was available in this, uh, this group of patients, um, where it was available, it was found to be subtherapeutic. And what's also interesting is that uh, there were 15 patients of the 389 patients who had six and 12 month TOEs who had a device related thrombus. And within this group of 15 patients, two of them had strokes. So that's roughly uh, sort of just under a 10% rate of stroke uh, in patients who've got a device related thrombus. So device related thrombus is an issue, right? It's not just a passing phenomenon. I think it does mark out a high risk group of patients who are at risk of uh, potential events. So we can use the device related thrombus as a marker for us to try and judge uh, how we might um, guide our therapy. Now obviously again, because of the concerns about using warfarin in patients that are warfarin contraindicated, um, <coughs> there has been a, a prospective registry that's been done with the, the Watchman data, with the Watchman patients. And uh, in 150 patients who had a relative contraindication, um, they used aspirin and clopidogrel alone for six months and aspirin alone. And the interpretation of the data, which isn't, it's only been uh, released in limited uh, form so far, uh, there were three strokes. Um, and they felt that the event rate was comparable to the event rate in Protect AF. But we should bear in mind that this event rate that they were comparing it to were, were all the events in Protect AF. So that includes the intention to treat. So these were the periprocedural strokes that were related to air embolus. This was includes the patient that had a stroke prior to the device being implanted. So the actual event rate is, is a, uh, for the implant device was, was a little less. And by the time the ASAP register was taking place, a lot of these operators were uh, far more skilled at placing the device and uh, implanting a, a device with a good outcome. So I'm not sure that we can necessarily directly compare uh, the, the two sets of data. Now, that's the, the Watchman data. Now, as far as the Amplatz or cardiac plugs concerned, um, amp the ACP device has come to this from a slightly different uh, angle. Because the device had been used, uh, or a, a, um, a previous generation of the device had been used for ASD and PFO closures uh, in younger patients, usually just on aspirin and clopidogrel, the general con view from the company was that their device was safe with just aspirin and clopidogrel. And if you look at this data uh, published in 2004, um, there were 1,000 patients that were, that were studied in a, and 20 uh, patients were identified as having thrombus on the device. Now we see the Amplatzer device had 0% uh, thrombus at four weeks and there was one at a six month check. And this was, appears to be performing better than some of the other devices that have uh, been uh, listed here. So the company's view that, that uh, the Amplatzer may be safer to use just with aspirin clopidogrel certainly seems to hold true with uh, this data. However, that group of patients were patients who uh, didn't have AF, they were for patients who we would think of having less thrombotic risk. And if you uh, look at that, within that group, those patients that had atrial fibrillation, we now see that there was a 20% rate of thrombus formation, okay? Now, unfortunately, the paper didn't break this down by device type again, but the important thing is that we can't necessarily compare what's been seen in ASD PFO closures automatically to what's happening in the, um, the older AF population. And <coughs> if we look at the registry data so far in terms of uh, patients that have aspirin and clopidogrel, there is an event rate. It's difficult to say at the moment um, whether this event rate is uh, related to the drugs or to uh, other factors. Now the other issue, of course, is there is a technical issue in terms of uh, deploying the device. Um, we see uh, residual gaps and you have to look very carefully for residual gaps. In this case here, in this view, the device looks very well deployed, but as soon as we look on FAST, we see this uh, rather ginormous gap there that can't be seen on this other view. Now, more typically, we see smaller gaps like this, and recent data uh, published suggests that about 40% of patients will have a peri-device uh, flow. And with the relatively small numbers that, that are available, um, they concluded uh, that um, that the gaps didn't seem to make a significant impact on uh, outcomes. 
but I think this data is still too small and too early for us to make any definite um, judgments. But again, it goes back to the view, when you see a gap, how can you protect uh, that patient from forming thrombus in the gap until endothelialization is uh, completed? And I would argue that warfarin would still be the best way of doing that until that point. The other slightly sort of confusing error which uh, has been uh, brought to light by this uh, paper is that sometimes when you think there's no gap at the time of the procedure, at subsequent TOE, there are gaps that seem to develop. I don't understand the mechanism for that. My own impression is that I think that might be related to interpretation of the TOE, but it's very difficult to judge that from the outside. But this phenomena of new gaps uh, occurring again raise the possibility that until a certain amount of time has taken place, we have to keep an open mind about the uh, potential risk of thrombus forming there. So that's some of the arguments uh, for and against uh, using warfarin at the time of the implant and subsequent to the implant. Um, now the justification for using clopidogrel instead in this high-risk group is that the argument is that clopidogrel may cause less bleeding than uh, warfarin. If we look at the active W study, we know that's not the case. And if you use aspirin and clopidogrel together and compare it to major hemorrhages, uh, it's very similar to um, it's very similar to warfarin, uh, with no statistical difference. So the idea that in a patient who is potentially at risk of getting bleeds, that by giving them aspirin and clopidogrel, we may be reducing their risk of bleed instead of giving warfarin. I'm not sure that we can necessarily um, make that conclusion. And of course, part of the reason for us using uh, clopidogrel with many of these devices is historical. It just happened to be the drug that was available at the time. We used that drug. It seemed to be safe with good outcomes in the younger patients with device closures. And so it's kind of continued as a routine practice. So with all the various anticoagulants and everything that we've got now, we could put together any sort of combination of regimes that we might use in our, in our high-risk patients. And I put this sort of uh, random collection here, and of course you could add clopidogrel into all of those variations as well. All of those that I've put there, I've put down aspirin as a potential long-term use. Um, even that isn't uh, something that we can just accept without debate. If GI bleeds are a group of patients that we're going to be using the, the Watchman devices in, we know that aspirin causes GI bleed. So how safe is it to leave someone on aspirin long term if they've had a previous GI bleed? Well, this study gives us uh, some reassurance. Uh, what they did here was they picked patients who'd had a GI bleed on aspirin, and they restarted them on aspirin once the, the, the ulcer had healed, but with addition of uh, gastric protection, and compared it to clopidogrel uh, with placebo. And what they found was that the uh, clopidogrel group actually had more recurrent bleeding. And in fact, there was very little. There was, I think there was only one patient that had any recurrent bleeding on aspirin and uh, esomeprazole. So potentially, we can use aspirin in our patients uh, who are at risk of bleeding long term if we give them gastric protection. However, there is a, a changing uh, tide at the moment in terms of whether aspirin should be part of our guideline for stroke prevention. And, an, and a lot of the, the guidelines have been based on this meta-analysis. And what has been, uh, dr been drawn to attention is that uh, this, uh, this meta-analysis relies very much on data from the SPAF study, which was the only one that didn't cross the, the, uh, the zero line. And if you look at SPAF in uh, more detail, there are concerns about the fact that in the uh, aspirin versus placebo group uh, through two arms of the study, the risk reduction in the two groups was uh, very different, 94% in one versus 8% in the other, even though in theory there were supposed to be similar groups of patients. And the heterogeneity of response to aspirin here is not so, it's something that uh, we can't quite explain. And so that together with some other data, there's been suggestion that maybe aspirin shouldn't be on our sort of long-term stroke prevention uh, guidelines. So in summary, um, I'd like to argue that at present, the only tested protocol under randomized uh, um, <laughs> criteria have, has been the protocol of using warfarin, a check TOE, followed by aspirin, clopidogrel, followed by aspirin. Now, trial assessment of the, the sort of variations that I was referring to in high-risk groups 
uh, may not be possible. And in fact, we're probably not going to get any uh, hard data on that subject for another maybe four or five years. So we have to try and interpret the data we have to the best uh, of our abilities. My impression is that surface thrombus formation on the device seems to be related to the CHAD score of the patient. And so you've got to be more aware of the patients with the higher CHAD score. And I think that thrombotic risks are device specific. So um, uh, the situations in which a, a watchman device may form thrombus may be different to the way an ACP device forms thrombus, for example. Um, with an ACP device, a device that's placed too far into the, the appendage may be more thrombotic than uh, with the watchman where there's more uh, cases of um, peri-device flow. We still don't know what the contribution of uh, clopidogrel is and the evidence for long-term aspirin is changing. So maybe what we should be doing is following that protocol within our own institutions if we decide that that protocol isn't suitable for some of the patient groups that we're working on and we change our regimes locally, then the only way we can validate our practice is maybe with more frequent TOEs in that group of patients. And then when thrombus is identified, uh, give targeted anticoagulation to those patients. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Pepper.